So I have Pete from Aussie English here, the podcast and YouTube channel. How are you going, Pete? Good. How are you going, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll let he he will introduce himself better than I can. So. Tell us you're about... all good. You're all good. Tell... Oh, we, just, no. we just had an hour chat, so I feel like you've got a head start now on the interview because you know a lot about um, what's going to come up and everything. But um, yeah, so so my name's Pete, and I am a. I don't like saying an English teacher because I'm not. I have no credentials in terms of um, teaching English, teaching a foreign language. My background's in science. I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in biology. But I ended up becoming a podcaster, creating English content focused on Australia to help people adapting to life in Australia. So sort of long story short, I learned um, languages at high school, sort of had very similar experiences to Lamont here, with, except with French instead of German, um, sort of let it you know, die for about a decade, came back to it later when I started going to university and meeting a lot of people from overseas and, and sort of felt a bit ashamed at the fact that I didn't, didn't speak a foreign language very well and they all spoke two, three, four languages. So I started picking up French, was listening to a podcast called Francais Authentique with mm -hmm. Johan Techfac. And um, you like it? Yeah, yep. he's awesome. And so I was ranting and raving about this podcast that was really helping me with my French listening comprehension when I picked it back up at, you know, 28 years old and was saying, you know, you guys from France, you guys from Brazil, if you're trying to learn English, find a podcast like Francais Authentique, you know, mm -hmm. surely there's something out there related to English and they were like, well, we want to, there don't seem to be any podcasts like the one you're describing and there don't seem to be any about Australia. Yeah. I'd done a little bit of podcasting and was like, I can probably do what um, Johan from Francais Authentique does. He mm -hmm. makes this really sort of intermediate to advanced content, really interesting, really engaging, but natural. Started doing it and then it just sort of took off from there over the last five or six years. And now I just, yeah, have a YouTube channel and, and the podcast and like an online academy and membership mm -hmm. website and everything. And that's my full time job. Yeah, cool. And so th this is one thing I was curious about because. Um, so Pete sent me a message on or a couple of messages on Instagram sort of telling me uh, his story with with learning languages and particularly like learning European languages and how that might be relevant to this channel and stuff. But it there was one kind of hole in your story. If I was being like an FBI investigator kind of thing, <laughs> you were like you you were like, oh, I was doing jujitsu, which I'm going to assume is Brazilian jujitsu, right? You know that. Yeah. yeah. And then you're like, so I decided to pick up French again. And I was like, what? Yeah, so the people I was training with, there were some Brazilians there originally, but because I had the background in French, I was like, mm -hmm. you know what, uh, I'll start with French. I tried to pick up Portuguese first. And yeah. as you were saying in the interview with me, you, you started with Duolingo. I was doing Portuguese and Duolingo, smashing right. it and trying yeah. to pick it up. And I was just like, to be honest, I was lo I looked at my life and I'm like, I'm not you know, there are one or two people from Brazil that I kind of interact with, but in all reality, I have about six, seven friends from France. I'm using this much more frequently. I just had one foot on each sort of boat or on each side of the river, and I was just yeah. like, screw it. I need to just go back to French first. I'll get to Brazilian later. Yeah. And so I just went hard with with French. And again, I think really similar to your story where I was using Anki after I smashed Duolingo. I think I got like a, you know, a 500 day streak and then wanted to kill myself and yeah. after, I lo after I lost yeah, it, I was yeah, like, yeah. never using this thing again. Yeah. <laughs> but I was doing like between four and eight hours of French a day. Yeah. Um, not active study, yeah. but you know, reading books like Harry Potter. I mean, I would do, you know, I would have the printed out Harry Potter and go through it and, and you know, cover it in notes, put them into Anki. Yep. Um, study Anki and then watch the, the Harry Potter movie with French dubs and you know it just snowballed yeah. and seeing the results from that was just and doing it at home with the internet was just really motivating and it sort of just kept getting more I was a few times I'd be listening to podcasts and I'd be like I wonder how many hours of podcasts I can listen to in a day you know and you realize that that's five yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like wow okay so that's you know that's not bad yeah yeah and you just keep challenging yourself and and eventually the results start speaking for themselves yeah. and you just yeah all of a sudden i was like i'm more fluent in french now uh, back then after six months of studying at home than i ever was after six years at school and having gone there for a month and so i was like um, you know i was i was astonished 
but just yeah wanted to help other people get those same kind of results because i would meet a lot of people who not without tooting my own horn mm. felt like um, they had a lower level in English than I did in French, yep. and they'd been learning English for a long time. They were studying in Australia and everything like that, but they weren't getting the results that, that they, they should have or that they wanted because, yep. not necessarily because they were stupid or anything, but just they weren't implementing the right sort of techniques. They weren't using the internet. They weren't using podcasts the, the way that they could, and so it ended up becoming my sort of mission to sort of help people especially you know niche down and get used to australian slang australian accents australian culture and history and everything else on top of just the language yeah and to sort of keep going my wife now um was living in townsville she's originally from maranhão in northeast brazil she was she'd come over to australia with her partner at the time their relationship had ended she was focusing on her english and sent me a message on Facebook when I just decided to switch from French to Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, said to her, because she was like, I'm from Brazil, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, send me a message. And if you want to do some exchange or something, I'm happy because I'm trying to find partners to learn Portuguese with now. And um, just hit it off in our first conversation. And it was like one of those things where I was like, I remember sitting there and just having, like talking to her. And I was like, how do I get this woman to Melbourne? You know? (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, it, it's, it became one of those things where it's like, holy shit, she's in Melbourne. How do I get her to stay here? Holy shit, yeah. she's staying here. How do yeah. I get her to marry me? <laughs> and then it'd be, here we are with, you know, our second kid on the way. So, yeah. and my, ironically, my Portuguese now shits all over my French, which yeah. I have thoroughly and ashamedly left to sort of um, wither in the sun. Although I can still sort of understand a lot. I just yeah. have not been practicing it at all. But, um, yeah, it's been an interesting process. I would never have picked that I'd be uh, raising children and speaking Portuguese with them in in the house 100% of the time or near 100% of the time as yeah. a uh, young, young 30-year-old. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <We are. laughs> yeah, it's it's weird the way you, you, your life just goes in these directions. And I think, so Pete and I have been talking about how we're quite similar in that we will pick something up and just do that and nothing else for like, you know, maybe a couple of months or even a couple of years. And then at least for me, it's always gotten to the point that it's just starting to become useful and I could almost make money from it. And then I would just be like, this sucks. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> well, I wouldn't even actively make that decision. I just forget yeah. about it entirely. Um, but so at least for people like us, like our, your life can just take a totally different turn without you even really knowing about it or like seeing it coming or anything like yeah and it's i remember thinking the the interesting thing was that when i first picked up portuguese it felt like a real chore i remember thinking i remember thinking how weird it sounded and i'm like oh spanish is so much sexier like why am i not learning spanish in terms of how it sounded yeah but it's so funny how much that's sort of arbitrary and when mm. enough good things pop up, like a, a wife and, and children in that language, or you start doing jujitsu and there's a lot of Brazilians and you suddenly get, you dive into the culture, it's so funny how all of a sudden you fall in love with, with something like that when the you know, motivations and, and everything align. Yeah. And it goes, it just snowballs. Because initially, you know, I thought, oh, I'll learn Portuguese as a laugh to just be able to have, you know, easy conversations with my coach in front of the rest of the class speaking English. Yeah. And now I, I think, holy crap, you know, like I'm quote unquote fluent in this language I never really thought of ever learning until a few years ago. And yeah. so, yeah, life, life can be pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. And like I, for a lot of the things that I'm now into, I, yeah, I used to think that they were like the dumbest thing ever and that no one with a brain would ever spend their time on that thing. And with Swedish, I don't, it wasn't even that. It was like, it, there was less acknowledgement than that. I remember watching uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo with my wife in 2007, I'm going to say. Um, and just knowing so little about Swedish that this movie being in Swedish is the most I know about Swedish. <laughs> like, I, I do, I like. I know it must be European, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you where Sweden was. I wouldn't have been able to tell you that it was related to German or a Germanic language or anything like yeah. that. I remember just being like, "This movie is in Swedish," and that's that's about it. If you had told me then that thirteen years later I would be about to start reading the book of that 
in Swedish, yeah. I'd have been like, get out of here. Like, what? Well, so, it blows my mind having those moments because I think, you know, five, ten years from now, where the hell and what the <laughs> hell am I going to be up to? You know, yeah. like, am I going to be learning Hindi on, in the Himalayas? Or, yeah. you know, like, you just have absolutely no idea of where things are going to go or what you're going to be doing. Yeah. Um, so, on that, like, you, you've come from a, I'm going to say, a strong background of science in that most people running uh, most people running a language youtube channel or a uh, sorry a, a podcast or a, a learn english podcast don't have a phd you have a phd right mm -hmm. in in evolution <laughs> kind of say that say that evolutionary biology, biology of yeah, yeah. <laughs> that do you think that to an if we're if we're going to be a little bit mean and describe the language learning world as a bit broken in that like so many people around the world are trying to learn a language in the wrong way and I would say especially English which they're trying to learn as we talked about on your podcast they're trying to learn like it's a serious endeavor for them they're not yeah. they're not doing it for fun um, but they're probably quite a few of them are doing it wrong like they're they're reading grammar books and stuff do you think that uh, one of the problems with that kind of language learning is that, oh, sorry, w one of the reasons that we've ended up here with all these people learning a language in what I'm going to boldly just call the wrong way, <laughs> um, is that the science or people don't acknowledge the science on language learning or people like think that the jury's still out on a lot of things? I think that tends to be a lot of the case with not necessarily all all schooling, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of schooling in the way that it's set up isn't based on necessarily, you know, what's best based on the science. It tends yeah. to be we've always done it this way and so we need to keep doing it this way. You know, yeah. the schools were set up, I think, in the mid to late 1800s, yeah. at least in, in the Western world, in order to make factory workers because you needed people who could do rote tasks. So they needed to have basic maths, basic English, and that was about it, you know. Yeah. So, but we've kept it because it was, it was, you know, what we've always done and it was useful at doing that. But it didn't catch up when we made a big shift out of factory workers into, you know, the modern era. And I think yeah. that's the biggest problem. It's, it's really good if you want to compare people to one another in a very sort of controlled environment. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily play to individuality and the, 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 different ways in which people learn and, and can flourish. And so you end up sort of stif stifling, I think, a lot of people, no matter what the endeavor is, whether it's English or, you know, language learning or, or maths or music, because we're just set in our ways. But, yeah. you know, that said, what the hell else do you do when you have to be one teacher teaching 30 people a single um, subject? It, it's a lot harder and I think a lot more to ask of teachers to be like, tailor an individual learning plan to every one of your students. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're going to be yeah. like, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're already overworked for nothing, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. Well, so I was, like, I was more talking about... Um, wait, what <laughs> What question have you just... Had? Like, I feel like you've, you've talked about something slightly different, which is fine. Um, I more mean that, like, actually the... If you, I'm, I'm guessing you've heard of Stephen Krashen. Yeah. Right. So his hypothesis is basically, and I'm going to simplify it, that we learn language when we hear something and understand what it means and that that builds what he calls, I believe, a subconscious model of the language, which is where like we actually know how that language works without realizing that we know how it works. So that's why we can speak English so fluently it's because we don't actually need to think about the ways all these things go together. They just yeah. go together the same way as with, like I move my hand like this. I don't need to think, no, I move it over here and whatever. Um, but I feel like a lot of the what we think works is like active study. It's like, OK, that that is useful for a certain thing, but you know, that is useful for getting to a certain stage in a language, but if you really want to speak it really fluently, you need to build up a subconscious model of the language and that that comes through hearing things that you understand and preferably 
a lot of it, like as much as possible. Kind yeah, of thing. the and, intelligible input, right, and having yeah. contextual language exposure. Yeah, but but I think that like either there's not enough science on this for so so you were kind of going the, the other way in that going like well everyone learns like has their you know the ways they learn um which is true but um but i was just thinking, i guess to cage it there though yeah. i think that a big problem is that the schools would focus on very specific measurable things yeah. and so when you're focusing on things like i need to rank these children because they need to get a certain enter score to get into university mm. they need to know how what percentage exams and they're sitting these exams and have to answer a question and there needs to be a black or white answer yeah the, the, the way in which it's broken is that yeah it tends to be the only way that you can have those kinds of systems set up to measure is based on grammar or mm. you know um yes no answers multiple choice or, you know and and that's where i think it sort of falls down a little bit because ultimately language isn't about it's not black or white you know you don't no. say something and either it's 100 percent understood yeah. and if not it's not understood at all it's some it's usually in between right yeah. where it's about communication and that's where i feel like at least um language teaching at schools focuses more on understanding all of this, you know, high level concepts that native speakers don't even necessarily understand, you know, ask yeah. someone about the present continuous tense in English and they'll just yeah. be like, what? Yeah. But it should focus much more upon communication, effective communication. Yeah. And the thing that always shat me when I was at high school would be that I would be doing, answering a, a question and I would use the wrong verb tense, for example, mm. in French and I'd get mm. a zero and I'd be like, well, did you understand my answer? Yeah. And they'd be like, yeah, for sure. And I'd yeah. be like, why is it wrong? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I mean, it's, I know it's grammatically incorrect, but yeah. you understood it. And so there's, there's this like, it's kind of a weird message to send, I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I had... <laughs> I have a friend who, um, um, he's an anaesthetist. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, anaesthetists are almost like the kind of, they're the nerd's nerd. Like they're... Professional killers who keep you alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like they have to learn so much medicine that they have to confidently almost kill you without actually yeah. killing you. Um, yeah. And so the, the anaesthetist's exam um, which costs a whole ton of money and can in Australia can only be done in Melbourne, which is where Pete's from, by the way, um, or, or where Pete is now at least. Um, they, it's just it's intense. Like even for other other medicine students who have already done well, it's known to be a very hard uh, thing to do. And uh, he complains that at school when the it was like if you have three liters of milk and then you drink a liter then how many what do you have left and he would write two and they would give him half a mark because he forgot <laughs> to write liters and he's yeah. like yeah but if i'd just written liters would you have given me half a mark so like it doesn't make any sense <laughs> Well, I, I think this is why we have so many people, whether they're Australians, Brits, Chinese, Japanese, learning foreign languages who feel like shit. They don't have confidence when they speak. Mm. And I think it's because we set them up to be like constantly self-analyzing. Mm. Am I getting this right? Oh, my God, I need to form this sentence. Why can't I think in English? It's because like you're constantly trying to think in your own language to get everything, you know, yeah. put together. Then like only then express your idea and still with a lot of trepidation and you're like oh my god i hope i didn't get it wrong and it's yeah. sort of like you need we need to completely remove that kind of um second guessing of yourself and and lack of confidence it's a big hindrance and that seems to be for people like you and i who are learning languages later in life we learn that a big big issue with gaining con confidence is to just let go of making errors mm. and you realize that you end up actually all things being equal yeah, communicating better when you let go, even yeah. with the mistakes. And yeah. So we don't reward that, I think, a lot of the time in, in traditional language uh, classes. Yeah. But I don't know how else you would do it en masse. But I'm sure that the science, you know, if you were to dive into to second language acquisition and language mm. learning literature and linguistics and everything, I'm sure that they would have better answers for how to do this. But yeah. it may be that it's it's not, um, you know, easy to, uh, to apply on a mass scale. Yeah. Well, personality comes into it as well in that I'm a very, I like things to be sort of detailed and, 
and and correct and you have to actually even just for YouTube you have to let that go a bit because unless you want to make two hour videos on a very simple topic then you have to just like skip over details every now and then and just go it's basically like this yep. it's not quite right but I'm not going to talk about the bit that isn't quite right um, but that means that I do I have to sort of put in effort to let that go when I speak uh, Swedish or French because otherwise I'm always like is that ex is that exactly right like well and the beautiful thing about languages sorry to cut you off but right. like Port Portuguese for example I, I spent ages with a, a bunch of grammar books learning mm -hmm. all the grammar and then you realize that actually compared to say French it's spoken spoken completely differently it's they break the rules they they conjugate you know pronouns with the different and and quote unquote incorrect um you know conjugations in the third yeah. or second person you know they reverse them they yeah. chop words they do all this stuff that just isn't how you would learn it and so if you if you have people that just focus way too much on that stuff you can almost um cripple yourself to some degree from the beginning yeah. where you've been better off just diving in and and knowing that the that stuff will take care of itself later like with grammar learning people ask me what do you do in order to learn grammar and it's kind of like once you've got the base of you know exposure to them you know the 2000 most common words and you know how to make the most common phrases if you need to learn something like i will have been there Mm. you know, um, tomorrow afternoon or whatever it is, yeah. something complicated like that, just look it up. You don't have to go through and do shitloads of exercises to try and yeah. remember that by rote. You know, you kind of, you're going to come across that once every few months. Yeah. So just, just research it when it comes up. You know, it's kind of like wait for the fires to occur and then put them out. Yeah. Well, or I would even say like if you get enough input, so if you if you read and listen enough, then you'll kind of work out what, that means and you'll exactly. end up you'll end up being able to say it without even realizing that you were able to say it um so yeah there's like most things in swedish are constructed pretty similarly but uh there's a few things where i've noticed myself just saying like and actually even when i've been speaking a lot of swedish or listening to a lot of swedish i'll try to say the same thing in english like i'll try mm -hmm. and say like mm -hmm. um i'll try and say like <laughs> had you know went i to the store then and it's like wait no that, i did that i do that bizarre. in portuguese where i'll yeah. say uh, like my wife will be like do you want uh chicken or beef and i'll be like oh, i'll i want the both of them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you could like you could say that but it would sound pretty weird like exactly exactly yeah. but it is it is funny how these kind of like patterns below the language themselves um, in your mind kind of yep. get um, solidified and then you know that strata is what you kind of use to then form the words that spontaneously come out when you're communicating and at yeah. times both Portuguese and English I'll rearrange things based on a, a pattern a sort of you know mm. system I already have in place for one language yep yeah I know exactly what you mean so so speaking of which um, tell me of the year you so Pete spent a year um, speaking only Portuguese at home um, here in Australia. Yeah. So obviously you had to speak English outside of the home, but well, my parents weren't really very tolerant of me just speaking Portuguese <laughs> to them. So <laughs> I actually wonder how my parents will react if my whole thing with speaking my uh, speaking Swedish to my younger son works out. Like when once we're kind of once he's of speaking age. And everything. I love it, man. My parents get yeah. off on it. They're like, yeah, it's so cool. Bilingual family. Woo, go Pete. <laughs> yeah. Even though they can't understand. Well, they understand bits and pieces, but yeah, obviously yeah. that, you know, like every time my, my dad will um, call me up and he'll be like, Oi, tudo bem? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like, and I'll try and continue the conversation. He'll be like, yeah, yeah that's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's trying to learn a little bit, but they, I think they really enjoy it and they like the fact that Noah is going to be raised a um, simultaneous bilingual as opposed to someone like you and I is sequential where we learnt it later in life. Yeah. You know, we need more of that. But um, yeah. yeah, sorry, what was the question? Yeah, yeah. Be? So how did you cope with the temptation to speak English? Because I think it's one of those things that people go like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn this. It'll be easy. I just, I'm just not going to speak English anymore. Like, that's just, I'm done with it. And they don't realise that just like I was saying in your podcast, that it's actually a, a bit of an addiction that we have to expressing ourselves clearly and fluently and understanding mm -hmm. everything that we hear basically perfectly. 
that's an addiction that you don't realize is an addiction until you try to give it up like um well, like especially around or especially around other people who where english isn't your first language because yeah. there's kind of a hierarchy that's kind of unspoken right if you're the the native speaker and the language that's being used is english and mm -hmm. everyone else that you're speaking with is not a native english speaking english speaking person you're at the mm -hmm. top yeah and the moment so for instance when mm -hmm. i have parties with my um friends that i've met with my wife since um you know getting married and everything and they're all brazilians when they come over all of a sudden the hierarchy switched yeah and i'm the one that's bottom bitch you know yeah. i'm at the bottom now and i'm the one who's who's you know struggling to keep their head above water when the conversation's going crazy about brazilian politics or whatever yeah. um but you just have to kind of embrace that and just yeah. i think i just um i just stopped caring you know mm. it, it was a fight at the beginning you realize I think most people wouldn't realize until they do something like that, like learning a language or picking up a task later in life, a, mm -hmm. a hobby or something, where all of a sudden you're surrounded with incredibly capable people who've been doing it for decades. Yeah. And you're the one who's like, oh, I just started yesterday. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna gonna crush it today. Let's see how we go. And you realize, <laughs> you know, you get a cold slap in the face that, yeah. um, oh God. Yeah. But I think you just have to get used to it, and it, you know, I think too they appreciate it at least in my context because they're all. All the Brazilians would be English learners as well, so they they know that the hierarchy switches the moment the language turns to English. Yeah, and so that we both have a sort mm. of mutual appreciation for one another, and so that's sort of reflected in my relationship with my wife, where I'm I'm 100 certain that her English shits all over my Portuguese because yeah. she's using it um, anytime she's not at home, and she was using it for, you know, a few years without me around with most people up in Townsville and, um, you know, anytime she left mm -hmm. the house and my exposure is pretty much only with her or when I go out of my way to see other people. And so, but we have that mutual understanding of we're both, um, foreign speakers of another language. And so it's, yeah, I don't know. There's not not really much fear there, I guess. Yeah. And so a big big part of implementing it though is catching myself all the time, because I do have this thing inside of me where I'll be like, it is just easier to go to English because my yeah. wife's English is you know phenomenal yeah. compared to my Portuguese. Yeah. And so the the path of least resistance would be for us to just speak English, uh, yeah, English all the time and yeah. to avoid Portuguese. But my yeah. Portuguese would suffer as a result. Yeah. And so a big part of it is just realizing that although in the short term that would be a more comfortable and easier path to pursue in the long term, especially as our, um, you know, son grows up and we've got a second one on the way that I'm hoping to raise in Portuguese as well at home. As their Portuguese skyrockets um, with my wife, I'm going to be left in the dust. Yeah. And if not, it could be worse where there are families that we know where um, the woman is Brazilian or, or the, the husband is Brazilian and the, the partner's Australian and they've just refused whether, you know, intentionally or not to, yeah. to learn or, or have anything to do with really picking up the language and encouraging the children to learn it. And as a result, the children are kind of like at about the age of five or six, see that the mum and dad are kind of don't speak Portuguese. I feel embarrassed. I'm not going to speak it anymore. Yeah. And I'd, I'm terrified that that's going to happen with my kids. And so that's another thing. You know, there are all these motivations and things that are sort of playing behind the scenes that make me decide I'm just speaking Portuguese at home. It's uncomfortable. Look, it's not 100% of the time. Sometimes English just comes up. There's a question that needs to be asked about a specific thing in English. You know, you just can't avoid that sort of stuff. But for the most part, you just have to go to, to Portuguese. I think one thing that people really underestimate with, with learning a foreign language is that it's, this is sort of similar to what I was saying on your, on your podcast. It's not quite like um, learning to skateboard or learning to draw or something because most people can't draw that well. Some people can draw really well, but they're, they're the exception and everyone knows that. So yeah. if you can draw a little bit, then you're actually better than most people. Whereas when you learn a foreign language and you try to speak it with native speakers, that is like going, stepping onto the court with Roger Federer kind of thing. <laughs> like you get, yeah, every single little bit that you're not good at gets shown bare. It's yeah. the same with jujitsu. That was the same thing where if you, if you go and start learning jujitsu and your coach is say a, a purple belt, which mm. is, you know, second after white belt at the beginning and two away from black belt. Yeah. 
it doesn't take that long. You can get to, you know, purple belt in a few years, maybe four or five years, and all of a sudden everyone else is below you and you feel like you're on top of the world. Yeah. And it's easy to stay somewhere like that because of your ego. Yeah. But there are those people who end up surpassing everyone else and becoming amazing because they're constantly going elsewhere to find people way better than them, than them to like hand their ass to them yeah. on a plate on a regular basis. Yeah. But And that's sort of the problem with language learning, right? Because it's like if you suddenly start learning a foreign language, you go to the gym and all of these natives are there and yeah. it's like, here are all the black belts and yeah. it's my first day. Exactly. <laughs> like, but that's the, like most people don't realize that they, okay, they may not be Roger Federer in that they're like one of the top 10 in the world at that language, but they've done, they've spoken that language for as more hours than Federer has played tennis which yeah. is kind of ridiculous when you think like we don't do anything else for that long in our in our lives generally unless Probably breathing you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, unless you are a professional a professional athlete or a professional at something there's almost no one does anything as long in their yeah. lives as they speak yeah. their language um so and i think that's what people underestimate cuz like i would have these conversations on italki where i would feel quite fluent and then I would go to the Swedish cafe in Sydney, which is like actually kind of worse than Sweden. Like not that I've been to Sweden, but like from what I hear, because in Sweden, they're used to tourists and they're used yeah. to needing to speak English and, um, you know, and they like to speak English. But at the Swedish cafe in Sydney, that's like the one place they go to not speak English. Uh, okay. And so it's really good. It's actually a great place to learn Swedish. But at the same time, like when they speak to each other, there it is no holds barred. Like there, there, there are things like I would, you know, I would be able to almost read books by this point, and hearing natives speak to each other, I was like, they may as well be speaking Turkish. Like I have no idea yeah. what they're saying. I don't even know what this conversation is about. It was like mime artists kind of thing. Like I was just like watching what they were doing with their hands to try and pick up what they were even talking about. Well, the irony of it, especially with language learning and being a native speaker of a language, is the fact that you don't know. Like, you have no real appreciation for the amount of skill that the average person has at something, right? Like, yeah. my, my sister's always whinging about how bad she is at languages. Mm. And I'm like, you know, sorry to be politically incorrect, but I'm like, mm. you're fucking retarded. <laughs> you are one of the most intelligent people I know in English. Um, you know, listen to the, can you understand the language that you're using when you're speaking to me and the amount of hours that you've put into it? And it's like, okay, yeah, you don't have the motivation to learn a foreign language, yeah. but to, to say something like, I'm just horrible at languages yeah. is is really myopic. Like you just don't get it, right? Yeah. And, and so I think that that speaks to people more broadly who are monolinguals, yeah. I would say. And, I, you know, it would have been my opinion originally as well of just like, oh, I guess I'm just horrible at that thing. Not realizing... You know, it would be like a black belt in jiu-jitsu saying, man, I'm just horrible at sports. Yeah. And you're just like, who are you? Like, yeah. <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah. What are you saying? I know. So it is funny how we just don't, yeah. we don't appreciate the, the, the skill to which we speak a language you yes. know, from the beginning. Yeah. And it's, and like even English, okay, it's not, it's not the world's hardest language, even from a kind of a neutral standpoint. Like there is somewhat yeah. of a way that we can grade languages and, English is not the most complicated language, but it's certainly not the most simple either. Like we do have tricky things again that we were talking about in your podcast, like where we separate the verb and what it's conjugating with by like a whole sentence. But still, most native speakers will do that without even thinking about it. Like they yeah. will say they and then they'll go blah, 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 speak. And they won't make the mistake of saying they blah, 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 speaks which yep. most non-natives will make at some point in their in their learning time if and, and may never correct kind of thing. So yeah, I work with a guy who has a Swedish wife actually and because in our work environment I'm not really in a position where I can have like a half hour debate with him, I just had to accept like or pretend to accept when he was like, Yeah, I'd I i do not have like I don't have a language gene. 
kind of thing. So he yeah. doesn't he doesn't speak a word of Swedish, and I'm like, but yeah, Dude. it just does sound like that thing of like, uh, so I'm an Olympian, I do the high jump, you know, but I'm just I'm just horrible at sports. Yeah, you know? I don't know what it, I just don't have any fitness genes or sports genes because <laughs> yeah. this is you know I just. It's just, yeah, it's it's funny. But I think it's a, a cop out though too because I think in the West, I don't know what it's like in other countries obviously because I didn't grow up there, but especially in Australia, I think a lot of us have a chip on our shoulders with not speaking another language because we are so exposed to, you know, Asian cultures, European mm-hmm. cultures, Middle Eastern cultures where they do speak more than one language and often a third one which happens mm-hmm. to be English, right? The yeah. average person you probably meet in the street and speak English to in Australia who's a foreigner probably speaks another language before English that's probably better. Yeah. And so it, I think it is a kind of Western chip on our shoulder and it's easier to say, I guess I'm just horrible at languages yeah. than saying... Actually, no, I'd be really good if I applied myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems modest, but it's actually just kind of lazy. It's a cop-out. Yeah. But I think, too, people need to remind themselves, you know, it, you don't necessarily have a reason to learn a foreign language. Mm. Somewhere like living in Australia, what, la- what foreign language are you going to learn if it's just mm. going to be an arbitrary, you know, I want to speak two languages, which one yeah. do you pick? Yeah. You know, the, we'll go for Indonesian. Because Why? Because mm. that's next door and I go to Bali sometimes. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but even then, what, when are you going to use it? When are you going to, you know, so you have to have a kind of motivating, you have to have a sort of setup, right? You need to be thinking about if you actually do want a language, it can't be learn a language. It can't just be because you want to learn a language. It, there needs mm. to be all of these other things that are sort of underneath that to prop that up so that it's maintained for a long period of time and you actually get some fruit bearing from that tree, right? So yeah. I think most people in Australia don't have a particularly strong reason to learn a foreign language. Yeah. Um, well, like well, they probably, be upset. probably one that would make a lot of sense for or would make the most sense for the most Australians that well, the two would be <laughs> cruelly either Mandarin or Arabic, like because yeah. there's incre- <laughs> which is like two of the hardest yeah, languages. no, it's basically like okay, you guys, you guys who have been monolingual for two hundred and thirty years, you can start with Mandarin and Arabic. <laughs> well, that's I get I get massive Europe envy, right, mm. or even Asian Asian African Middle yeah. Eastern envy, where they're they can just go for a drive. And an hour later, they've crossed a border and they're in a completely different country, different culture, different language, different languages. Yeah. And they can just pick them up. You know, you talk to anyone in Europe and they've probably all been into foreign countries. Mm. You know, if you live in France, you can drive for half a day and you're in Spain, Italy, Portugal, Germany, you know, Belgium. And throw a rock and you're going to hit someone who's a native speaker of a different language. Yeah, yeah. But in Australia, I mean, obviously... We can meet immigrants, but we have the problem of that they all probably speak English way better than we will ever speak their native language, even if we tried to learn it. Well, I don't know about that. Like, I'm I'm going to challenge that because I, I mean, I I was telling you before about the um, the Venezuelan girl I work with, who's her English just seems to have stopped at a fairly low level. Like, if she ever hears this, I I love her. She's great. But her English is not good, and it and it noticeably affects her ability to work and stuff. I actually got to see her work in Spanish once, uh, as in I got to see her do her job in Spanish, and she was just a totally different person. Yeah. Um, so like I, I, th- I think that yes, okay, for most Australians meeting someone else, that they are not going to get to the point of being better at at that language, but like. You know, I I don't know about you, but I meet a fair few people who who don't speak English very well. I even was in a part of Sydney once, and a guy just came up to me and asked me something in Mandarin, and I was just like, <laughs> "What? <laughs> uh, you must be really confused." <laughs> well, that's I get a... that from my friends who are actually from China and but but grew up in Australia. They get that, and they're like. Why do you yeah. just assume that I speak Mandarin? Yeah. I mean, I do, but why do you just assume that? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the. I said to my mum, who I was with at the time, I was like, why did he think I spoke Mandarin? And she said, well, round here, like it was in a very Chinese area of Sydney. Okay. She was like, round here, people probably do. I was like, yeah, but do those people look like me? I feel like that's that's a bit weird. But like, I I feel like, yeah, there are there are kind of areas of Sydney and Melbourne and the other capitals where you'll where they kind of stick to their own culture quite a lot. That's a big and, part of it. And that's yeah. kind of, it's a controversial topic. 
because Australia is, you know, constantly touted as being a melting pot. We've got so many different cultures here. It's a beautiful yeah. place to be. Um, but they tend to get a wise, which is yeah. sort of what's going on in Sweden, right? I mean, have a look at Malmo. Mm. And once it get a wise is because you've got a certain threshold where a certain number of those people from wherever it is, could be from France, could be from, um, you yeah. know, China, and they end yeah. up in a single place. Obviously, the culture kind of takes over because they're the majority in that area. Yeah. And so it's, it becomes harder. You know, I've met Greek people and Vietnamese people who don't speak English and they've lived here longer than I've been alive. You yeah. know, they can say hello. Yeah. But it's so difficult. It's, it's interesting when you find out more about their stories. I mean, I worked in a, um, a Woolworths um, factory and there were a whole bunch of Vietnamese. And the, the manager that I had, he spoke pretty good English. I mean, mm. really good for, mm. for his age. He was about 50 years old. But his mum also worked there. She was like in her 70s. Yeah. Spoke none. No yeah. English. And had been here for 40 years. Yeah. And it's because she's just constantly lived in the same Vietnamese community in Box Hill or wherever it is outside of Melbourne. Yeah. But also, she didn't want to come to Australia. Yeah. She was forced to leave Vietnam because of the Vietnamese war. It wasn't like yeah. she was like, you know what? I can't wait to go study in Australia and integrate into their society. It was, yeah. I have to pick a country and leave here and probably don't even get to really choose where I go. And so, obviously, their motivating factors for learning the language quite often are just like, well, pfft. Who am I going to speak Vietnamese? I mean, English too. I've got all my friends here who yeah. are Vietnamese, and I'm not going yeah. to you know, go to classes at, at you know 50 years old or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it is interesting. Yeah, it's a, sort of. This is going to seem like nothing to do with what we we're just talking about because it isn't. Um, <laughs> um, we, you mentioned in the in your video on um, only speaking Portuguese in the house for a year. Uh, you mentioned, and probably it was probably longer than that now, because you pretty much still only speak Portuguese in the house. Is that correct? We're about to do another year's video, so 24 months of okay. only speak yeah. um, Portuguese. I think yeah. I think that video was made in at the end of August last year, so okay. almost ready yeah. for the second one. Yeah. Um, did you you mention something about like at f at first you you would watch like certain Brazilian shows or whatever. And then after a little while, I don't know how long, you were like, "These are actually crap." Like, <laughs> like did you find that as as a general thing? Did you did you notice that thing of like at first you'll actually take anything that's in the language, mm -hmm. but not well, just I that. Find you... myself, I find myself watching a lot of shit that I would never watch in English. Yeah. Okay. But still. And it's sorry. Still. Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, it depends if there's something. For instance, Portuguese is probably a different story. I don't know what Swedish is like in terms of dialects and accents. Mm. I assume that there's variation, but yeah. Brazil has a um, yeah. F ton, yeah. uh, probably 30 at least different dialects and, or yeah. different accents. And so I'm always fascinated if I can find a good show that's from a certain um, area, even if it's about, like I watched one recently called Sintonia, and it was about um, you know the favelas in, in Rio, and a girl who ends up going to the church, another one who's like a singer, and the other one's in, um, you know, a gang and kills people. Yeah. And it was it's just effectively um, a novella, is mm -hmm. what they would call it, where it's yeah. just like, um, what would you call it? Just a drama, you know, just yeah. BS that I would never watch in English. Yeah. But because it had the added layer of all of this colloquial spoken Portuguese, where I was learning a bunch of slang that I would never use because my wife's from the north. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it was interesting. Um, I found it way more fascinating than I would in English because I would be getting something completely different from it. I yeah. wasn't, I wasn't watching it for the entertainment necessarily of the story in and of itself. I mm -hmm. was watching it as a means of improving my Portuguese, and so I can detach those two things when it comes to language learning. And but yeah, there are a lot of shows. There are some really amazing ones yeah. in, in um, from Brazil in particular. Mm that you know you get addicted to but then there are a lot that i would just i would never watch in english but i watch in portuguese just because i'm like all right this is study yeah well i ask because i found that i mean it's pretty obvious when you think about it but it was still surprising to me that uh one of my initial kind of things in swedish was i just had these like first eight chapters of an audio book on burned to a cd like an audio cd not 
not an MP3 because my car doesn't even have an MP3 CD player, it just <laughs> had a normal CD player. This is like massive first world problems here. But um, <laughs> so it doesn't have Bluetooth, doesn't have plug in, nothing. You could, you've got a CD player. So I yeah. had the first eight chapters of an audio book burned onto this 80 minute CD. And I didn't really plan to listen to it that much, but it just kept going round. And whenever I'd start mm-hmm. the car, I wasn't going far enough that I could be bothered like doing anything. And I don't like the radio. And I was just listening to this Swedish, this same eight chapters over and over and over again. And this, I started this early. So I had uh, almost no Swedish when I started listening to it. And How advanced was it? Oh, it's an adult's audio book. Oh, like, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> I was ambitious. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> see, that's a, like someone like Matt would would have been like, yeah, what's the deal? Like I would. <laughs> I think I saw you guys talking about that. I think you mentioned someone who listened to the sounds of, was it German or something for a year? Yeah. Yeah. Before mm-hmm. actually trying to speak it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's probably a, a um, the law of diminishing returns probably applies there at some point in yeah. the year of yes. just, you know, listening to hours of it a day without well, actually studying. <laughs> it, it's... Well, see, I was studying, so I was yep. gradually picking up a bit more of it. But like with a language related to English, there is like there is a certain amount that just the repetition, you'll be like, they must be saying this because yep. I can pick up like one in 10 words just because they're like the English enough. Mm. And then and then like that would slowly become like one in nine words where you were like, hang on. It must be that. Like, there's nothing else it can be. But also, I had a lot of misinterpretations of it where I'm like, yeah, they're saying this. And then when I actually learned it well, I was like, no, 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 that's not. I I had a totally different. I recently did. Sorry, we'll come back to that. But I recently did a reaction video where I took. I I wanted to find a bunch of um, British accents or great Mm -hmm. accents from Great Britain and from Ireland to show my wife and see how much of them she could understand. Yeah. And it was really funny when showing her these incredibly difficult accents, even for me to understand, how much her mind would try and put the story together, even if she was way off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so it, it was, yeah, it was it, hilarious to see that. Yeah, it reminds me of um, uh, when I went to the cricket when I was when I was um, young, and and we were with these foreigners. I think they were like French or something. I don't remember, but they like no one could explain the rules to them because their english wasn't very good anyway so they made them and, up <laughs> yeah they they made up this and then later when they told their like um their french speaking australian friend like they were like yeah we saw this game where this happens and he's like do you mean cricket and they were like yeah and they like they watched a whole day of test cricket for those who don't know a whole day of test cricket is 6 hours of cricket um and they explain to him how this game works and he's like no that's not right <laughs> <laughs> they had watched this whole game thinking that that's what was going on yeah the guy <laughs> hitting the ball was meant to be hitting it to one of the opposite players <laughs> exactly <catch. laughs> they had this, they all i remember i don't know how they got this impression but they had the idea that everyone including the batsman had the job of keeping the ball away from the bowler yeah uh, but then occasionally they would have to like give the ball back to the bowler. I think it says something. <laughs> it reflects human, human, um, you know, biology and the way that our brains work, and that we're yeah. tr- we're constantly trying to work out patterns and how things fit together and, and yeah. get an explanation for something. Because even if it's incorrect, it may be better than having no explanation exactly. at all. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the same with with language learning, right? It's like that all the time, where you'll be having probably for the first few years of learning any language, you have conversations where you keep getting hit with these fuzzy bits or blurry bits where you don't actually, you can like, oh, yeah, I understand. Oh, that fell yeah. out, got back. Oh, yep, yeah, not fell out. Yeah. And you kind of have to, have to get used to just filling them in. And even if you get them wrong, quite often it doesn't stop the conversation from going no. forward and from communication, um, you know, being able to continue. But if you were to just stop it every time and be like, I need you to explain this thing exactly before we can move on, it would be a big problem and you'd run out of conversation partners. Exactly. And it's even if you make a really embarrassing mistake, it's it's better than like just Man, they're like, the best no. kind. Yeah. They're the best kind. You as soon as you can laugh about something, good example in Portuguese is that one of the hardest things for um, English speakers to learn are the nasal uh, vowels. So yeah. you'll have you'll have the um, 
you know, the, the normal one, ow, and mm -hmm. you'll have ow. And mm -hmm. so you'll say something like pow, which means, uh, I think it means chunk of wood, but it's slang for dick. Yeah. And pow, which means bread. And yeah. so for a long time, bread is an incredibly common word that you're mm -hmm. going to be saying a lot, generally. Yeah. And English speakers will end up saying dick instead of bread. Yes. But you have to just laugh at those experiences because yeah. by and large, I don't think many people would get confused that when you say you're hungry and you're after some dick, <laughs> what you actually mean is the bread that you're pointing at. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. And you just have to laugh at it, keep moving forward. And I think it, it's a good... If you can enjoy that process of making mistakes and then poking fun at yourself and laughing, it makes um, speaking with confidence so much more, you know, natural and, and, and easier and, and much more enjoyable. And I think, especially with Portuguese, they've got a really good sense of humor mm. in, in Brazil. I yeah. pretty much just, you know, shit on myself constantly when I'm talking with native speakers and make jokes about myself. And, and so, you just like, well, I'm not, how else can I feel stupid? It doesn't yeah. matter what happens now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so going back to my, <laughs> going back to this audio book that, so like, yeah, as I say, it was, it was a full, it was a book for adults, uh, and I, and I only had the audio of it. Um, and so I, I, I listened to it, I don't know how many times, these first eight chapters and like novels particularly will start like a good novel at least will start in like not like not at the beginning necessarily like the first chapter will be like you know it was it was a crime novel so the first chapter was like this this girl like dying basically like so it sort of starts in the middle of nowhere and then you kind of have to figure and i remember just thinking like yeah this is a good book i can't wait to understand this completely <laughs> like and and now i'm like that's a that author's actually pretty crap like just like now that that veil has been lifted and I can see all the things. I'm like, well, yeah, she, she uses good Swedish, but actually her storytelling is pretty rubbish. It's like, kind of like my, my son and his palate, I think, with, with eating food. He, yeah. he started out just smashing whatever we gave him. You yeah. know, we'd give him broccoli and just carrot and smashed up potato and little bits of meat. And he would think it was the best thing in the world. Yeah. And slowly, as we start introducing other foods, all of a sudden he starts developing a taste and he'll refuse certain things and likes other things. And now mm. it's like a real battle to get him to eat anything that's healthy and not just, you know, sultanas or, or chips or something. Yeah. So it is funny. Initially, when learning a language like that, you, you, can, you enjoy learning about anything. I think yeah. when I was learning French, I was like, you could tell me about how to clean a toilet. And I'll enjoy it because I'm trying to understand and I'm getting satisfaction out of following the conversation and yeah. and in understanding the words. But once you get to a certain level where that's sort of a given and now you're focused much more on the narrative and the narrative's weight is much more important than, yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have, I think. It says something about yeah. your Swedish. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, it's and it's the same with, like, well, like with your your podcast, like, people want something that is is challenging because those podcasts that like let's learn the 10 english ways to say hello today yeah. they're just like and then the ultimate is like us trying to watch them we're like what is this it's just so like it's so well, they're not talking clean. naturally yeah. yeah i know yeah that stuff that was a big thing with me initially you know i think everyone starts in that sort of area when they start teaching something they think okay the easiest way to teach something is dumb it down make it mm. simplified and then just give it to people but i ended up just being like you know what we're just going to throw everyone in the deep end you guys will learn to swim yeah and and it'll pay off sooner if you can stick with it and so, and that was the same with Portuguese. I ended up, we, we moved to um, Canberra, the capital of Australia, because my wife got a job at the um, Brazilian embassy there. Mm -hmm. And we, for anyone who knows Canberra, it's a bloody nightmare trying to find a house at, in March because there's so many students and, and army people and government people trying to find a house. So we were yeah. seeing houses with like 100 applicants. So we kept moving around to different houses and ended up in a house with four Brazilians. And... The good thing about learning Portuguese now is there's a shitload of Brazilians in pretty much all the major cities of Australia. Yeah. In the most, probably in the last ten years, they've just migrated here en masse. In my experience, uh, especially in Melbourne, like oh man, I, yeah, I have low. like I teach English as well on Italki, and and most of my, I say the majority of my students are Brazilian, and the majority of them are living in Melbourne. Like yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. there's there's tons. There's huge communities of them. It's sort of yeah. get, ghettoizing as well. Yeah. Um, but we ended up. I ended up seeing all these um, places that we could live, and I actively chose one that had Brazilians in it because I was just like, screw this. Mm. You know, it's time. It's mm. time to yeah. to really take it to the next level, and it's going to force me to only speak Portuguese. So I think. As a point there, for anyone who is not in an immersive environment with their language but has the ability to create their own immersive environment, whether or not that's moving into a house, um, that is a, doing that as much as possible. I think I saw with you um, in one of your videos studying 57 hours of Swedish in a week. You know, you changed yeah. your phone to Swedish. You um, were, were, you know, on your computer in Swedish, doing yeah. everything just as much as possible. And I'm sure that if you could just move out of the house into another house with Swedes for a week, you mm. would have. Yeah. But but that was a big step for me, at least, in in improving my Portuguese from the beginning. And the good thing is that, you know, it was hard to swim at first, mm. but you realize after one day, after two days, after a week, after two weeks, you're having the same conversations all the time. And so the same yeah. vocab's coming up and you build fluency rapidly in a very niche kind of area, you yeah. know, home, home living vocab. Yeah. And, and you, you build upon that kind of island, that base, you know, a really strong base that you can then kind of venture out into the, you know, surrounding waters or jungle of that island yeah. to, to discover new stuff, but then come back to where you're, you're comfortable and you're safe. And so that was a really good process for me, I think. Just I'm glad that I did that for about five months. Yeah. And, then, and then it led to that, that video of, um, well, it led to the year where mm. we were living together in Ocean Grove when we came back to um, Victoria. Um, of just speaking Portuguese at home. My wife was pregnant by then and we were just like, I need to get my Portuguese to, to a good level before our son's born. Yeah. But I th there was once there was something I did want to bring up mm -hmm. for you guys and the, the viewers. I To be honest, to be sort of candid about it, mm. I think I kind of rested on my laurels way too much after that, after probably the first three or four months, I reckon. If, I, yeah. if looking back on the amount of improvement that I had, I, I think it would it would do that. Yeah ladder off because I got comfortable talking about what we always talk about every day. What are you going to have for lunch? What do you want to do tonight? Did you want to go out later? And you, you don't realize, and I think this goes back to your Venezuelan friend, mm -hmm. how much it's just the same shit all the time. Yeah. And, and the work suddenly gets put on you to push your comfort zone and to yeah. find new content. And like I was busy with work and busy with raising a child that I wasn't consuming many TV shows or reading many books. And so looking back, I think if I were to do the second year video now, I'm going to have to say that I don't think my Portuguese has really improved. My fluency's yeah. improved yeah, uh, because it's been the same stuff all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think if you, were to, if you were to somehow be able to analyze my uh, grammatical understanding and vocab and everything, I don't think it will have dramatically improved over the yeah. last year. I might be wrong. Yeah. But so that was an interesting point that I wanted to say to people, don't just sit on your laurel, rest on your laurels when learning a language you really have to keep pushing you know stay right at that edge of your comfort zone like going to the gym don't just lift the same weight every yeah. day yeah you know you have to keep increasing it to, to get the improvements that you want to get yeah yeah i i only read the first half of it because it's sort of i felt like i got the point after that but um i i borrowed an interesting book from the library called the potential principle which talks about like how to keep expanding uh what you're capable of and the basic idea is that there really is no such thing as reaching your potential because yeah. you, if you reach it, then that just means your actual potential has expanded. So you, there's always room for you to reach new heights kind of thing. And he we starts, use that as a springboard, right, to yeah, get to the next step. Yeah, and he starts with this really interesting example. I th interesting, really strong example, but I think it has, I just try to remind myself of this as often as possible. He's like the world record for cycling on flat, and I think it's done on like the Utah Salt Flats, right? So it's not even road. So it's it's, it's slower than it should. It's slower than it would be on a road. Yeah. Um, is like, and this is like under your own powered bike kind of thing. He's like, what do you think it is? And you're like, whatever. And then you turn the page, and it's like, it's in miles, but it's. I think it's 192 miles an hour, which is over 300 kilometers an hour. And he's like, whatever you thought it was, you didn't think it was that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was just like, what? Now, it turns out, I want to be clear here, there's like 
they use a car to get them up to a certain speed, but then there's rules about that they have to accelerate from that speed. Uh, like the car. So they're can... on a bicycle? Or yeah, they're a... on a bicycle. Holy crap. Right. But it's, so the bike. Can... <laughs> I'd want to be on the salt flat as well and not on bitch. Yeah. <laughs> so they're on a bicycle, but like the. And I was like, hang on, how could you possibly get a bike to 300 k's an hour? A bicycle, sorry. Yeah. Um, but it's like they use a car to get them up to about 200 k's an hour. And then the bike is so heavily geared that like one pedal mm-hmm. gets them like 25 meters or something like that. Wow. So, so you know, there's ways yeah. of doing it. But it's like the point is it's so much faster than was ever thought possible in, in, any, like, in any cycling circles ever kind of thing. Um, and he makes the same point. He basically says like well, you can apply that to whatever you're doing. Like whatever you, th- you the level you're at now is not the best you can be. It's just the best you know you can be currently kind of thing. Well, I think um, that's a way you have to train yourself to have that kind of an attitude, right? Yeah. It's, and and two, not to compare yourself to other people. I think that was a big thing when I was doing jiu-jitsu. You'd always get beaten by other people, but you yeah. would realize that the conditions are different. You know, if you get if I get choked out by a guy that's three times my size, I can't really beat myself up on how crap my technique was. It's kind of yeah. like, well, you know, it's just not really apples, apples and apples. Yeah. But... Yeah, I think you just have to keep having that thirst of how do I improve and and comparing yourself to who you were yesterday, to have that con- context context in 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 sight. And it's like don't aim to be better than you know a native speaker or than mm. this guy over here or that girl over there, but aim to be better than you were yesterday and just keep applying that day in day out. And whatever yeah. it is that you're doing, you're going to improve, right? Yeah. And so on that, so we we're kind of with stumbled upon to like fairly we're talking about reaching lang- a fairly high level of language but like at least now like when you did your year of um or now it's been almost two years of speaking only portuguese at home do you want to keep using that to 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 make your portuguese really good to help your kids or do you want to learn another language or do you want to go and apply it to something else like well, it's funny because after getting into your content, it really motivated me to sort of be like, just just stay focused, you know, time on task, you you think you're good, you know, get a reality check, you can be better than you are. You know, and I, I watch a lot of Jordan Peterson and, mm-hmm. and it's always that, you know, he the way that he speaks about people I really love because he's kind of like very compassionate and he sees that you're trying hard, but you can do better. You can be better than who you currently are and that's what you should aim to be doing. And so I think after watching a lot of your videos, I was like, you know what? I could get distracted by all these shiny things. You know, I've got a few different language books down here and I would love to learn a whole bunch of languages, but I think deeper is better than wider ultimately. And so for me, I mean, I've had to reflect and think about what I want to get out of Portuguese, what level I want to be at. Yeah. Because I could just step off the boat and just be like, you know what, I'm I'm happy being conversational like this. Yeah. But but at the same time, I think my ego, um, currently can probably deal with with the level of my Portuguese. But if I were to step out of this environment once COVID's over, and um, suddenly surrounded by a bunch of other Brazilians, or we go to Brazil. Yeah. Um, I think then I'll feel like, oh, I wish I'd worked a lot harder. Yeah. And so that's been a big motivating factor for me where I'm just like, I just need to keep pushing and just see where this goes. I need to get, it needs to get harder and harder and harder because it is interesting how often the moment you kind of let go of the accelerator, you you think, oh man, things are getting easy. You know, like mm. I watch the same old TV shows, have the same old conversations, read the same level literature and you're kind of like, man, I'm just cruising. My Portuguese is great. Yeah. And then I'll like at the moment I'm reading, um, what am I reading here? 1984 Yeah. in, in Portuguese and it's not the yeah. most complicated book in the world, but yeah. there's, you know, 10, 10 words on every page that I'm learning. Yeah. And so I'm just like, I guess I just keep going until I can't find any more material where that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and it's, yeah, so and so that's what you want to do. Like you, you, you want to go deeper rather than wider. Because I don't, I don't think that deeper is necessarily better than wider. It really depends what you want to do. Like this is this is something I wanted to sort of talk to you about because I kind of I got started on the language learning thing and wanted to be a polyglot. You know, yeah. I was massively motivated by Benny Lewis and Steve Kaufman and uh, Lucas Lamprioli yeah. and a whole bunch of these other guys. But it just, 
I guess it was, I think, and I've seen in your videos too, where you, I think, have spoken about it just being like, oh, well, I wanted to learn a few languages. I want to be able to speak a few languages. Mm -hmm. And I don't really think that's a, it's not a good um, reason for trying to undertake what it is to learn a foreign language. Yeah. It is probably one of the shittest reasons because it really says, I want to be able to show off. Yes. Unless, unless below that it's more, I, I have an intrinsic reason to want to be able to communicate with and share cultures with. But if it is just, I want to be able to speak three languages and yeah. that's my motivating factor, which yeah. might, that was me at the start. I was yeah. like, man, that's so cool. I just want to be one of those guys. Yeah. But you don't appreciate the amount of work that goes into it. And then not even that, the amount of, of work to maintain any yeah. language. Yeah. So I would love to know what you think of or what your journey has been with, with polyglots because from, from the beginning, I was always, I think, in my naivete thinking, you know, people like, um, what's his name, Richard, who's learnt something like 50 languages yeah. now. Yeah. My instant thing in my head is like, Jesus Christ, this guy speaks 50 languages at a C2, Yeah. you know, and you're just yes. like, how is that? Like, I feel like shit. Yeah. <laughs> my English yeah. isn't even a C2. Yeah. <laughs> But then yeah. you, you, I think I, I just feel a bit uncomfortable with the polyglot community at times because I feel like there is a level of mystique that they need to kind of maintain in order to keep the status that they have, which is these master language learners. Mm. But I don't know if it does damage or not to, um, to, to other would-be polyglots or other would-be language learners. So I'm always a bit like, I don't know how to, how to think about it because I think too they go wide more so than deep. Yeah, well, I think. Okay, and again, it's not to shit on those guys. Yeah, I yeah. still find it amazing, and they do achieve yeah. phenomenal things. And I think yeah. their goals are just different from what I had him, I anticipated initially when yeah. I was, you know, learning about them. Well, I think there's always a question of how real do you be, like on, um, on, because like even even Nathaniel Drew, who I kind of like I like to shit on if I'm honest. This is like, the seven Portuguese in seven days, dude. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like he kind of make he he basically made a, a cinema movie out mm -hmm. of like learning Italian in seven days and learning Portuguese in seven days. Um where like to me that's about as realistic depiction of anything as like any movie that you would just go and watch at the movies. Like the difference is and then, and then he made a video called, um, like, for those feeling discouraged or something, where he basically goes like, "Yeah, but I think like, I saw that the other day. yeah, he's like, all, all, all this is like kind of not real. Like, there's an there's an extent to which none of this is real. And like that that bit is actually completely true. Everything you see, like most of this shot here, is about as real as you're ever going to see of my of my uh, language learning studio or my where I work." Um, Whereas in my videos, which I film on the camera, it's zoomed in so that you can only see that part and I make it all nice and everything. Like, in reality, this room is a freaking pigsty. Like, it's... it's bodies lined up on the <laughs> wall. On the <laughs> <laughs> there's, like, there's just stuff all over the floor. I'm super messy and one day I want to clean up and, and make a video actually about that, like, and about, like, cleaning up and cleaning up the mind and all that. But, but like, th this isn't reality to an extent. Um, the difference, the what I, I still had a problem with that video even in that I was like, yeah, but like, no one's going to see Batman and saying like, yeah, but that's not real. Like, everyone knows that's not real. <laughs> the problem with the I learned Italian and I learned Portuguese exactly. in seven days is it looks like it is. So I think there's always that, that question of how, and I've chosen to be a little bit more real than some other, like, polyglots and whatnot. I'm not saying that they're all, like, totally fake. I'm just... I've chosen to show a side that uh, that maybe other people don't like talking about, which is like just how many hours and how like how how long I spent just going. Should I even continue studying both languages? And finally, just going. No, I'm not going to. And whatever. And because of that, I have gotten some flack, like not very much at all, but some from people who were like, "Oh, why would we even listen to you? You clearly suck at both your languages." And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't suck at both my languages. I sh I'm deliberately showing you how much yeah. I can suck at them at yeah. times. Like if I was, if I was genuinely as bad a Swedish speaker as 
some people seem to think I am, I would not be able to do the things I can do in Swedish. So I know for a fact that my Swedish is pretty good, but I'm I'm choosing to share parts where it's like it very much is not good. But I think it's one of those things. It's kind of like, say, in in the fitness industry, I I would find it much more comfortable to have a personal trainer who could show me when they were not fit mm. and the work that they had to put in to then become show me the transformation. Yeah. And and you know bones at, bones to bear. Show me everything, yeah. right? And yeah. I would feel much more comfortable than just um, I'm only going to show you how I am now at my best. Well, or, they they do if, that though. Like they often do that like before and after thing, but normally because they're trying to sell you their that's that's course. I guess what I'm getting at too. It's yeah. very difficult because I think they have to maintain the mystique of being these gurus when yeah. it comes to language learning. Yeah. That it, honesty is a bit of a it's a negative. It's it's. Not always, but I think for the most part, they're not going to show you all of the 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 you know the horrible warts and everything behind the scenes yeah. because you would be like, "Oof, well, this guy's just a normal guy. Like, yeah. I can do this as well." I, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I but I, I I get frustrated a little bit because I feel like it, as you you were saying with this this guy, that it kind of sets people up to think they're failures if they can't get these you know learn French in seven days and yeah. s- speak after three months, and you just yeah. like. These these are very good um, messages to be putting together if you want to get views yeah. and if you want to get a reputation. Yeah. But if you are trying to make a difference and allow people to improve their languages and their lot in life as a result, yeah. I'm not sure how useful that kind of messaging is. Again, it's probably good in, in that it probably encourages a big percentage you know, of people to get involved with learning languages and get motivated. But I, I worry about how many people it demotivates to or, or just gives them the wrong idea yeah. behind what it takes. Because I have that with my English students that, that um, you know, buy my courses and my content in order to improve their English all the time. And they'll be like, I, I want to be able to speak fluently in three months or I want to mm. be able to do this. And I'll be like, you just need to... You've got the ability to do all these things ultimately and get English at a very high level, but you you've just got these um, weird goals set up in your mind for yeah. for no real real reason, and you need to reassess the amount of work that it's going to take, yeah, and how quickly it's achievable, uh, you know, and and then but you will get the results, but yeah. there's no secrets. You yeah, know, I could probably make a course that just says, you know, I'll make you a fluent native speaker in three months and I'll sell it to you for 600 bucks and I'll probably, yeah. you know, make a shitload of money and rip a lot of people off. Yeah. And the sad thing is it'll sell better than one if I sold for 50 bucks saying, you know, the, the two-year approach to becoming a relatively good English speaker. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, so to answer your question, I, I don't know. I think it's too hard to, like, lump all these kind of polyglots together because... Very- um, because, like, for example, Luca does, uh, he has done videos on, like... He's, he's one of my favorites, yeah. to be honest. I would love to know more about maintaining his languages, though, because it seems like a lot of them are in English, his videos, the bulk, mm. and the ones that he does in foreign languages, he'll do at the peak of when he was learning that language. Well, actually, I, recently... I haven't through too much of his content, yeah, but that yeah, was... That's, that's another problem with YouTube is people are normally only see like a couple of videos, yes. like even if they're reasonably well-versed in your content, they, they've never seen all your videos. Like no one, sure. no one's seen all your... Like I have people like reply with like timestamps. They're like, ha, huh, that made me laugh out loud. I'm like, what bit are you even talking about? Like I'd, <laughs> I don't know what... I didn't remember making a joke in that video. But um, yeah, like Luca did one recently in which he did, like he must have rehearsed for it. I'm, I'm, he's not trying to deny that, but like he spoke 10 of his languages, I think, without a cut, yeah. like about about a minute each for most for most of them without a single cut. And someone was ragging on his German in the comments, uh, which wasn't actually <laughs> that bad. Like, like, it, like I don't speak good German, but... Um, well, that's Another. it. If you can, it's just one of the ten languages sucked a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Like what? <laughs> and someone's like, "Oh, this guy's German was really hard to understand and stuff." And another German speaker was like, "I really don't find this at all. I don't know what you're talking about." But I was also like, "Dude, my Swedish isn't at its peak until I've spoken it for like 90 minutes." And yeah. he had he had to go between the ten languages without cutting or anything. 
I think um, more needs to be discussed though about the process and because again it's like a party trick I feel like that sort of thing where I mean I, I understand how much work has gone behind the scenes to get yeah. to that point where you can do that kind of thing mm. but I feel like to polyglots from my limited understanding I feel like yeah. a lot of it is I have a certain process of nailing the very inner circle of all that is language yeah and i just repeatedly stack languages on top yeah and and learn the, the 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 base stuff in order to be able to have conversations about my my life my family and everything yeah. which is incredibly impressive yeah but at the same time don't look at that and think holy crap this guy is able to study physics at yeah. any university in anyone's any one of these countries and would would have a an easy time of it just remember he has been training a very 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 small small aspect of each of these languages over which they all you know they all overlap yeah and he, he'll be able to have these kinds of conversations i would imagine with all these people yeah but as well it's hard because i feel like the audience extrapolates out Mm. They see, wow, he can do this bit really good. Therefore, boom, you know, yes. like everything is is at that level. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of people have this on-off switch, of, like an on-off version of language. Like someone asked me the other day, like, how long before you become fluent in Swedish? I was like, mm. I am fluent in Swedish. I'm just not like highly proficient in Swedish. There's like, but like I've been fluent in a way for quite some time. Like you could also ask how long before I become fluent in English. It's like, well, does fluent mean never pausing and looking for words? Because I just did that then. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> it's been 33 years. How long does it mean? Well, and I think you need that needs to be more discussed about. You know, we need to talk more about what what are individual people's goals. What do they mm. want to be able to do? You know, uh, because if if your goal is to be able to just travel throughout Europe and have and get by and be able to navigate through, then obviously following the polyglot sort of methods and getting a, a really strong base in a whole number of languages is the most efficient way of doing that. It's not going to help to learn about physics and maths and no. you know all this other arbitrary stuff that's not going to be used. Yeah. But if on the other hand you're someone who's trying to immigrate to a foreign country, get a job in that language, start a career in that language, you know, um, have your children raised in that language, it's probably not useful to be um, just just getting your toes wet. Yeah. All right. And that's like, that's kind of, it, well, that was one of the decisions in, a, sorry, one of the factors behind my decision to fo focus on Swedish. It's like, well, you know, people say, oh, Swedish isn't very useful. It's like, well, actually, when you're a native English speaker living in Australia, no language is useful. Like, yeah. English is well, useful. You have to make it useful, which yeah, is hard, exactly. Right? And I had actually done a bit of that in that I now have these sort of, sort of friends. They're not like my besties or anything, but like people I see in Sydney um, who are Swedish and speak Swedish with each other because that's obvious. Um, <laughs> they're, they're Swedish. Um <laughs> Right, so it's like I've I've made it somewhat useful, and the more I read in Swedish, the more it will become like this is this is just a part of what I do now. Like I've definitely spent more time reading in Swedish in the last couple of months than I have reading in English, and yeah. it probably if it continues like that, it may well get to the point where it's actually it feels a bit weird to read a book in English. Like yeah. obviously, it'll still always be easy and possible, but. Like, well, I think yeah. that's why you're so motivating for me when watching these videos because you're doing so much without being in Sweden, without ever having gone there. Mm. And anyone can apply this to any language that they want to learn. And so when I'm you know, hearing these stories from you, I'm instantly thinking about the advice that I tend to give my students when they say I'm having trouble, I'm, my English mm. isn't improving despite living in Melbourne for the last five years. And I'll be like, well, what are you doing? Tell me about your life. How is it yeah. set up? Are you yes. living with other Brazilians? Why are you doing that? You yeah. know, if you're if you're living in a foreign country where there are Australians everywhere, move in with Australians. You know, are yeah. you work? You're working with Brazilians as well. Why are you doing that? You're reading yeah. Brazilian books. You're listening to Brazilian music. You know, it's like you need to completely reshape your life to be as conducive as possible to you accelerating in that foreign language, which is what you and I have to do with Portuguese and Swedish. Yeah. Otherwise, we get nowhere. Yeah. But 
it's it's important to get that sort of message out there and just to get people thinking that way of how do I treat this like a strategy game? How many yes. hours can I can I squeeze into my average day? I'll, I'll change my phone. I'll listen to music. I'll listen to podcasts. I'll watch TV. I'll read books. All of that is going to be in my target language. And the rest of the time, I'm just wasting if I'm doing it in my foreign, my my native language because yeah. I speak that language. Yeah. So I think people need to get those things aligned. But yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, and then sort of in a kind of circle of life kind of way, like doing that and therefore becoming proficient at a language will will actually help help your life. I mean, especially if you're like a Brazilian living in Australia, like. You, you're going to literally like expand your earning potential and all sorts yeah. of things by speaking better English. But even for me, like one of the things was like, well, if I'm going to help people to do this on YouTube, then I need to have done it. Like I haven't exactly. actually, I haven't actually reached a high level in in a foreign language. So what am I doing talking about it? Like, this is one of the things that I made motivated me to learn French and to mm -hmm. also learn. Um, Portuguese later on or to continue learning the two mm. because the both of them because I um I, I was like okay I want to I want to create content I want to teach teach English mm. but the average English teacher seems to have never learned a foreign language and have mm. no idea about the actual process of learning a foreign language and what it's like to be in the shoes of their students they they tend to be like well it's easy I can do it here just do this yeah and so but it was it was really eye opening to have to walk the walk but then to be able to have that kind of understanding of, ah, okay, I see why, you know, you're getting stuck in these places and, and, and why, you, you know, you, you forget just how much the average person doesn't know what they're doing when it comes to a lot of things, whether it's language learning or not. And, yeah. and, but at the same time, how many small improvements can make exponentially huge yeah. differences? You know, one of your videos, you were talking about productivity. And, and I think you, you were saying you had a question about um, how do I improve the way that I'm learning a language? And you were kind of like, like the Jordan Peterson thing, clean your room, you know, yeah. sort out your entire life effectively. You need to just have a, a productive life yeah. and the language learning will take care of itself, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I'm guessing we could. We I know that Pete and I could talk all day, like literally all day. Um, but I better round it off some point. I think this video has been at least an hour. So, oh, good. Um, I want to thank Pete for his time and go and check out his podcast, especially if you're uh, not a native English speaker and you want to learn Aussie English particularly. Um, Pete, where can we find you? Yeah, just go to aussieenglish.com.au or so search Aussie English in Google or YouTube or Facebook, you'll find me. But um, I guess, yeah, my sort of approach is more introduce you to interesting topics, learn about, you know, Australian culture, Australian history, all that sort of stuff. And as a result, your English is going to improve. It's not today we're going to conjugate the first five verbs in the, you know, the most common list or whatever. That, that, that bullshit is just not, you know... For my listeners and my viewers, it's more about creating interesting and fun, engaging content that you can just absorb and the, the English will take care of itself. But yeah, whether or not you listen to me, find content that, in whatever language it is where that's kind of the, you know, you're enjoying it, but it's challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And find a transcript. Get a transcript, guys. Always yeah. find transcripts. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Pete. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Lamont. I really appreciate it.